Hello there. Thanks for tuning into Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. Today on the program, we are talking about the position of Speaker of the House in U.S. Congress. Um, the status of that post is sort of in tumult right now. After the Republicans won back the House in the 2022 midterms, it took 15 votes to finally swear in Kevin McCarthy as Speaker in January, um, and he lasted less than a year before his colleagues in the party ousted him as Speaker, vacated the seat, and it took another three weeks or so before the party was able to find a new Speaker, and that Speaker has now been sworn in. That's Mike Johnson, but the, the position is in a... Um, in, in an era of uncertainty that we haven't seen before. So how did we get here? To understand the speakership crisis we're in, we're looking back today at a similar situation that happened in the 20th century in, in the House. In, in, uh, we're joined by uh, the, perhaps the most, whoops, <laughs> uh, perhaps the most qualified scholar to be uh, unpacking the subject with us, Professor Garrison Nelson. So uh, Garrison Nelson, has taught courses in American government, political leadership, and political parties at the University of Vermont. He's the author of more than 200 articles and professional papers on national politics, focusing on the US Congress and elections in Vermont. And he's a regular media commentator on C-SPAN and Meet the Press. He's also the author of the, uh, I think the, is it the only biography about Speaker Correct. McCormick? Correct. Right. <laughs> so 928 pages, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you know quite a bit about Speaker John McCormick, who, um, can you tell us a little bit about his speakership and what the position was like? McCormick uh, was a very influential uh, as, you know, uh, served in the House of Representatives over 40 years, and he was the, he served the longest in leadership posts than anybody in the history of the Congress. Uh, he had a deep, dark, dirty secret, which I discovered, and much to the displeasure of the McCormick family. Uh, John McCormick's father was a Canadian Scot, mm. hence a non, not really Irish, even though he was, grew up in the Irish ghetto of South Boston, and uh, his family went ballistic when this, this news about him was published, that I wrote about, was published in the Boston Globe. Mm. But McCormick, as I say, where McCormick was, played such an important role was with his ally, Sam Rayburn, who was the longest serving speaker in the history of the House of Representatives. And Rayburn was from Texas. And uh, he was born in, uh, born in Tennessee, but he was a, uh, you know, was elected from Texas. And McCormick and Rayburn uh, joined up in 1940. And they did so really at, at the suggest really at urging of Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt's majority had been uh, decimated in the 1938 midterms as a, as a much more conservative group of, of members joined the House, and to, and to sort of save the New Deal, basically, this alliance put together of Southerners and, and urban Catholics. And so Rayburn and McCormick began serving together in 1940 and served together until 1961 and Rayburn died. Then McCormick stayed on for another nine years, then he stepped down uh, in 1960. Well, 1972. So it was a, uh, a remarkably long alliance, these two guys. And they, uh, they were joined later by Carl Albert from Oklahoma, whose district of Butter, Texas, and then Tip O'Neill, uh, who was from Cambridge across the river from McCormick, uh, uh, and, uh, and then lastly by Jim Wright of Fort Worth, who was basically pushed out of the house by scandal. Uh, and driven out of the House by Newt Gingrich. Right. And so these are all Democrats? You're all Democrats. And it was Newt Gingrich who basically transformed uh, the contest for Speaker and t transformed the way in which members dealt with one another. And, uh, but, but okay, I'll start with McCormick and then I'll get it to get it Gingrich, who really say, had an unfortunate uh, role. Mm -hmm. uh, so McCormick, uh, as they say, was born, in, was born in South Boston, this Irish ghetto. His mother was Irish. His father was a Canadian Scot from Prince Edward Island. And given the fact that this is the Irish are patrilineal, i.e., you know, uh, lineage derives from the father, 
this man, McCormick, was an Irish. Mm -hmm. And this is a fact that he concealed. And I have an interview with his uh, last chief of staff, Joe Feeney, who said that John said, nothing is to be written about me. There will be no biography. Now, this is remarkable. Most politicians, and I've been in the papers of multiple politicians, you know, and lots of things they never said. They, they you know, let's say, elementary school, you know, uh, uh, report cards. I mean, even anything about them, they would store. But McCormick basically, his papers were sanitized by his nephew Eddie McCormick and by his chief of staff, then uh, Marty Schweig, who actually went to jail for imitating McCormick's voice and, and peddling influence. Mm -hmm. So it was a. Uh, so, uh, so so this book was very hard to put together. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I interviewed him in 1968. I just started at UVM. I was in, you know, first year, first year instructor. And I went to the Capitol. Uh, this is a, a meeting of the American Public Science Association in Washington. So I went to the Capitol and it was Labor Day weekend. It was virtually deserted. And I went to McCormick's office and I said, look, I'm, I'm a graduate student at the University of Iowa, just been hired by the University of Vermont, and I'm writing about the speakership. Is there anybody I could talk to about, is about John McCormick? And the chief of staff said, do you want to talk to John McCormick? <laughs> of course. It's the best guy <laughs> to talk to. So, so we, we, I, I was escorted to the office, huge office, a giant chandelier. And John and I, the two of us sitting down, and uh, he, uh, and I said, I have one question for you, uh, Mr. Speaker. How did you get on the Ways and Means Committee in your third year? Now, Ways and Means is a committee in charge of taxation. That's the most important committee in the House of Representatives. Right. So how, how did it happen? He said, it was a record. I said, I know it was a record. <laughs> how? He said, well, I went to see Speaker Garner. Uh, John Ernst Garner was uh, Speaker of the House then. He was from Texas. He was Sam Rayburn's mentor. And he uh, would later, be, as they say, uh, would later become Roosevelt's first VP. But nevertheless, Garner said to McCormick, John, where you been? McCormick was stunned. He said, I didn't even think he knew my name. Yeah. And he said, we want you to chair the caucus. This is very important. McCormick couldn't understand it. He said, well, you were in here, so we gave it to Bill Arnold. He said, how would you like to be on the Ways and Means Committee? How would you like to be on a seat on the most important committee in the House? You know, John, who was going to flabbergasted. He said, look, I'll get the Texans to vote for you, and you get Billy Connery to, you know, endorse you, basically. He said, blow his nose at you. Mm -hmm. Billy Connery is a congressman from my hometown, Lynn Mass. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know who Billy Connery was. We got a school name for him. We've got a, a Legion Post name for Billy Connery. And McCormick at this point reaches into his desk drawer and pulls out a cigar and hands it to me. <laughs> so there I am, you know, 26 year old, you know, uh, first year instructor at UVM, smoking cigars with the Speaker of the House. And it was just remarkable. And so he started telling me stories about Will Bankhead, who was the father of Tallulah Bankhead, the speaker, you know, Jack Garner, you know, all so just open up, just told me was one story after another. And there I am, just, now I, had, I wasn't taping it, and I, and, and I may have lost some of it when I was trying to remember it, but nevertheless, it was just remarkable. And how, why did you go into his office that day? You were looking to do some did research you, on... Uh, on him. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to somebody who knew him. Yeah. I didn't expect to, have yeah. to, to be in the office with him. And that's what's what, what, remarkable. So mm -hmm. he had it, and we had this. But uh, I um, started my career at UVM, which I you know, was involved with for 50 years. And I, did, I taught at other schools, but most of my career was at UVM. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, then um, uh, I got an invitation to go to Harvard to speak at the Kennedy School. And uh, he said, we well, talk about John McCormick. And I said, okay. So I called him up again. This is, uh, and we talked again. And he told me all the same stories that he told me back in 1968. Mm. 
But nevertheless, so I gave that talk at the Kennedy School. And at the Kennedy School, I was talking about this, the Austin-Boston connection mm -hmm. and how these two states, you know, these you know, urban Catholics and southern, southern moderates, not southern uh, conservatives, but southern moderates, work together to basically keep the democratic coalition together for you know, half a century and uh, to basically protect the New Deal, mm -hmm. and which is what they did. And uh, so, that was, so that was the talk I gave at the Kennedy School. Now, uh, now, to, now I went back to, uh, fin uh, one of the big projects I was doing was compiling committee assignments. And I've compiled every single committee assignment from 1789, the first Congress, up to 2010. Wow. Seven volumes, each a thousand pages each, published by Congressional Quarterly. I mean, this is this is sort of uh, this is obsessive compulsive sure. behavior, <laughs> uh, which I did. But I did it in the seven volumes, each around a thousand pages long, and it looks it looks very impressive. As I say, this is. Are you looking for just for the assignments themselves, or were you trying to find the yeah, uh, yeah. The, the stories behind? You know, what, what's it was the assignments themselves, and the reason I looked for the assignments is that because that defines a member's career. Right. It's your specialty. It's what your expertise becomes, and it's when and the Ways and Means Committee not only was control of taxation, the Democratic members of Ways and Means had the power to name all the other members of committees. Mm -hmm. So being on Ways and Means allowed you to make a lot of friends. Sure. And so as a consequence, uh, more speakers come out of the Ways and Means Committee than any other committee in the House as a, as a consequence. Mm -hmm. So John was given the keys to the kingdom, and, uh, and which, he, which he needed to say, which he loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, he played a very important role. He, uh, he basically engineered the naming of the first black chair of a committee. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this was a, a, and he knew this was historic and made a point of announcing it as historic. Uh, and over, over the objection of you know, obviously Southern members of the House and, and, a, and a, a, a number of members of the, of the committee that he, he engineered this, uh, this uh, selection. When was that? Oh, oh God, that was <laughs> a good question. 19, I think 1949. 49, the first black chair was 1949. Yeah, yeah, and it was, took, a, you know, took a while. Yeah. Um, he, was, he, was, he was in line to become chair of that committee. Mm -hmm. And he stepped aside so this black who was number two on the committee could become the chair. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how I you know, mentioned yeah. he engineered this. Right. John also uh, uh, made sure that the house barbershop cut the hair of black staffers. Mm -hmm. They, they weren't cutting, mm -hmm. blacks were doing in the barber shop, but weren't cutting the hair of fellow blacks mm -hmm. until McCormick basically uh, declared that that, that, would, that practice would end. Mm. He also was very, uh, he also was the first congressman to denounce Adolf Hitler on the floor of the Senate, excuse me, on the floor of the House in 1933. Uh, he had, in his district, a very large number of, of, of uh, synagogues and a large Jewish population. So his congregants in uh, you know, South Boston, you know, who are Jewish, told him what was happening in Europe. You know, the persecution had begun you know, by Hitler. And um, McCormick you know, denounced Hitler on the floor of the, of the, uh, you know, of the house. And, uh, he was, as a consequence, he was referred to as Rabbi John. <laughs> mm. So he was curious, so he was, I like to say, he was the uh, Yankees' favorite Catholic in mm. Boston. He was the Southerners' uh, favorite Northerner in the house. Mm. And he was the Jews' favorite Catholic. Mm. So he, <laughs> John was remarkably free of, of prejudice. But it was that, would, would did get him into trouble with with the liberals, mm -hmm. and uh, he when he succeeded to the speakership in uh, when Sam Rayburn died in 1961, and John was in line for the because the majority leader he was in line to be speaker. There was a lot of rumblings about opposition to him, mm -hmm. and there was a hope that they could get the uh, President Kennedy 
to help them quash mm -hmm. McCormick. Mm -hmm. In 1962, McCormick's nephew, Eddie, McCormick had no children, so Eddie was sort of a mm. surrogate son, uh, ran against Ted Kennedy, Jack Kennedy's youngest brother. And it was a brutal battle, the Teddy-Eddie battle. I, I was a student at Boston University at that time, and I was doing interviews, and boy, it was, mm -hmm. you know, these two, these two Irish clans going head to head, and uh, uh, Teddy easily clobbered poor Eddie, and, uh, but nevertheless, so, you know, having the, speaker, the speaker's nephew and the president's brother <laughs> running against one another. It was, and that was in Massachusetts district? In, 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 in the state of Massachusetts, was the U.S. Senate. Right, yes, okay. it was, so it was, quite a, it was quite a contest. I, I was doing research for uh, Professor Murray Levin at BU at the time. I, I was interviewing. Murray would assign us, he would assign us in terms of what we looked like. Because I had an Irish face, my mother's Irish. I would be assigned to Irish, uh, <laughs> Irish neighborhoods, <laughs> mm. and actually did get stopped for being the Boston Strangler at one point. Oh. <laughs> so McCormick was did end up succeeding Rayburn, is that correct? As, as right. speaker, I and, left for nine years. Yeah. But then he, so he was challenged as speaker at one point. Can you talk a little bit about? What yeah, and later, in, uh, as the civil rights uh, issue became more and more uh, to the forefront. Uh, there was an effort to push the House. No, the, 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 no, the House and the Senate each had uh, levels that could block legislation. The House had the Rules Committee, and the Senate had the filibuster. Mm -hmm. And so the Southerners would use these. Well, uh, they got they got the the uh, they expanded the uh, Rules Committee from twelve to fifteen. And now they had an eight to seven sort of pro-liberal uh, advantage, in, not, not a strong one, but, uh, but enough. So, but, so the liberals were pushing hard on the Civil Rights Bill. And the Civil Rights Bill came up in 19, after Jack Kennedy was murdered in 1963. 1964, the Civil Rights Bill comes up. And there's enormous guilt in America and the off the, the Congress, and they passed the Civil Rights Bill. And the following year, they pa passed the Voting Rights Act, which kind of, you know, so sort of enabled the Civil Rights Bill uh, to be implemented. So as a, uh, uh, John was presiding over the House during these times, but the liberals were, he had this friendship with a number of Southerners. He told me that in order to succeed, you had to have, the votes of 70 Southerners, mm -hmm. and which he did. And he encouraged us, he ingratiated himself with the Southerners. And they basically protect his candidacy against the liberals, against the stronger liberals. And so in 1967, uh, 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 they, uh, the liberals, you know, got about oh, 50 some odd votes against McCormick. And uh, John, you know, at that point, he said, I'm out of here. And he, uh, you know, he finished up the term and left. Uh, now, but he was very close to Johnson. John, he, Johnson, in the Johnson Library, the correspondence between McCormick and, uh, and Johnson is, is absolutely filled with affection. Love letters, because they both love Sam Rayburn. Johnson being the, the uh, mentee of Rayburn, McCormick with the ally, mm -hmm. and they would, you know, they, just sharing all the memories of Rayburn were very important. So John basically did his nine years. It was the longest continuous service in the, in the House of Speaker until mm -hmm. Tip O'Neill took over, and Tip was Speaker for 10 consecutive years. So the Austin-Boston, you know, they just ran the House for 50 years, half a century. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then it ended. And it ended uh, with the takeover of the House in uh, 1994, well, 1994 election, but 1995 they, they took over by Newt Gingrich. And Newt Gingrich changed the game by implementing, a, he had a, a set of, these are the statements you ought to use when you run against the following people. Mm. And it was, it was like traitor, crooked, Dishonest, uh, tre you know, treacherous—all all these incredible hate words mm -hmm. that Newt Gingrich urged Republicans to use when running against Democrats. 
So he, so the the kind of camaraderie that existed in the house disappeared, and and, and it is Gingrich who was singly responsible for it. And Julian Zell's, Zell's got a book about what Gingrich did called "Burning Down the House," which is really what he did. And the antagonism that exists within the house between the parties is a direct result of what Newt Gingrich did. To this day. To this day. Yeah. And what's made it even more interesting is that they're now turning on one another with the same degree of vitriol and antagonism within the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So Gingrich really unleashed the demons uh, that, that destroyed the camaraderie in the House. And that was a, I, hard to forgive him for that. Mm -hmm. I did speak to him when he came to UVM. He came to UVM at the behest of the uh, uh, UVM Republicans. And he basically took all the money in the treasury and left town. <laughs> I mean, no joke. Newt was not a, not a noble soul uh, mm -hmm. by any means. Well, um, one the the uh, oh, let me see what else I wanted to get. But oh, the but the uh, why McCormick was able to succeed early on mm -hmm. is he was a protege of a very famous mayor of Boston by the name of James Michael Curley was four-time mayor of Boston, four-time member of Congress, one, uh, one term as governor. And he was a, he was a wonderful, a, a lovable scoundrel. He was a bit of a crook. And, uh, and Curley uh, and McCormick were so poor boys, you know, from you know, ethnic neighborhoods. And, but Curley had served on the, the Foreign Affairs Committee with Jack Garner. And years before the, the First World War, so when so that's why Garner knew who McCormick was, was that he had his friendship with Jim Curley, and Jim Curley uh, treated McCormick as a mentee. So that was McCormick didn't understand why I, I'm the one who put that together. So uh, so now so McCormick uh, Mc, you know, here are some things McCormick's involved in Social Security. He was on the Ways and Means Committee. He wrote Social Security. He was in the office when uh, FDR uh, sent uh, uh, Vannevar Bush, uh, General Leslie Gro not, not Groves was not there, uh, but uh, uh, Stimson, the, the uh, Secretary of War, and uh, to, to discuss the atomic bomb, and George Marshall, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These three met with John McCormick and Sam Rayburn to get more money for the bomb. Mm -hmm. run out of, they were running out of money for the atomic bomb. And McCormick said the three of them came in and he said they had their faces in their hands. Mm -hmm. They were so you know, troubled by what they were doing that they were going to build this bomb, this great destructive bomb. Mm -hmm. and, but they found that they hid the money in various and sundry appropriations, you know, 100,000 air, you know, 4 million, you know. mm -hmm. ultimately they got enough money to complete the, the bomb, funding of the bomb. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, he was there. He was in the room. He, uh, Sam Rayburn, and Joe Martin, who was the uh, House Minority Leader, from, also from Massachusetts. So those are two, uh, you know, the Social Security and the atomic bomb. Uh, he was, as I say, uh, and uh, the, the nomination of Harry, Harry Truman as vice president in 1948. Uh, excuse me, 1944, where they got, they got rid of poor Henry Wallace mm -hmm. because he was suspected of being a security risk. And uh, the, the, uh, the conservative Dems lined up to get rid of him and replace him with Harry Truman. And of course, Harry Truman uh, succeeds Roosevelt when Roosevelt dies in 1945. Mm -hmm. And McCormick and Rayburn, McCormick, Rayburn, Truman, all very close. Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of, you know, uh, from hard scrabble families. And uh, uh, Rayburn did go to college, but neither McCormick nor Harry, you mm -hmm. know, went. So they had that in common as well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I had lots of pictures of him, Harry Truman with Rayburn and McCormick. Mm -hmm. So the. Uh, uh, the challenge to the speakership in 67, what did that look like? Was that, 
what was the because you you mentioned it's it was it took place more in the in the caucus. In the caucus. Democrats. It was in the caucus and led by Richard Bowling of, of Missouri and say who hated McCormick. I interviewed him twice, and it's. And uh, at one point, he said, why was it Tip O'Neill who got McCormick's blessing rather than uh, Eddie Boland, mm -hmm. who was uh, Tip's roommate, mm -hmm. and who uh, obviously Boland felt was a more appropriate choice. Mm -hmm. But I said, well, because uh, Eddie Boland had endorsed Eddie McCormick, mm -hmm. excuse me, had, had endorsed Ted Kennedy over Eddie McCormick in the 1962 uh, Senate race. Mm -hmm. And Boland, Pounded, he said, the son of a bitch would never forgive him. Pounded the desk with both fists, and the desk only jumped. And those are th big, thick desks, mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's in the book. I, I, I know such a, and we, I uh, interviewed him twice, and his hatred for McCormick was palpable. Mm -hmm. But he, but he was also very arrogant, and he was, and much, and and, the, and while the Dems may not have been happy with John McCormick. They disliked Dick Bowling, mm. so he was never able to uh, succeed in, in, in uh, overthrowing McCormick. Mm -hmm. But McCormick was just tired of fighting the battle, and his wife was dying, uh, with whom he had uh, dinner every night for the 50 plus years of their mm -hmm. marriage, and so he just just walked away, just left the speakership. And uh, McCormick did? Yeah, just you know, yeah. just, you know, just uh, as soon as the term was up. I never did not run for re-election, and you know, you went back. You know, uh, actually went to the hospital where she was staying, and had a bed. They had knocked out a wall, so that he could be in the same room with her. Mm -hmm. And they, they had no children, and enormously devoted to one another. Mm -hmm. She was eight, over eight years older than than he mm -hmm. was, so it was kind of a unique marriage. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was. Uh, that's all that really mattered to him at that point in the game. Yeah. And uh, what do you see as the you know do you see similarities, differences between some Matt Gates kind of led the challenge against yeah. Kevin McCarthy earlier this year, and and that did lead to and that was you know McCarthy did put up a fight and tried to hold on to the speakership and then ultimately couldn't. Right. Uh, what what do you see as a, a yeah? There's a, there's a lot of similarity between uh, Gates and Bowling. In terms of their hatred for the occupant of the speakership, and he was very uh, 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 and, and so uh, and as they say, bowling. You know, bowling actually was, was lining up a candidate to run against McCormick in his district, but didn't want to run himself. Oh, well, because he was living in Missouri, he couldn't run against him uh, directly, mm -hmm. but he was trying to find people to run against oh, McCormick okay. back home in Boston. So uh, he, I talked to the fellow. He, <laughs> he wasn't going to go very far, put it that way. But so now, so now we have so so here we have the House really, the the, the hatred that that engendered by Gingrich is spilled over to the the inside game. Mm -hmm. The Democrats don't hate one another. The Republicans do, mm -hmm. and they have pushed out. They pushed out uh, uh, John Boehner. Uh, from Ohio, they uh, who could call these guys legislative terrorists. They uh, pushed out uh, Paul Ryan from Wisconsin, and now they pushed out Kevin McCarthy. This is all this is all inside baseball. Yeah, that's what makes it so remarkable. All right. So now we have Mike Johnson. What do you think is 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 his relationship with these hard right Republicans? He's going to have to you know give them whatever they want. They're the ones who put him in office, and they're the ones going to keep him in office. Mm -hmm. And they've got. Safe districts, so they're not going to lose elections. Right, and you, th so in terms of the impact on the governance of, mm -hmm. um, you know, the House, what do you foresee? Will be, you know, we have an upcoming, uh, you know, potential government shutdown. What, what, what do you foresee well, will happen with Mike well, Johnson and the speakership? Well, here's his his key thing. We are right now. In a period of divided government, the House controlled by the Republicans, the Senate and the presidency by the Democrats. Now, <laughs> this is now a common feature. I've got this sort of a uh, since the uh, Reagan took office in uh, 1980, uh, then we've had uh, uh, 22 Congresses, 16. 
divided government. 73% of the time, divided government. Mm -hmm. And this and divided government makes it difficult for anything to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I think the divided government has, has uh, spread the malaise that has settled over the nation because very little seems to get done. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly see this, you know, with the Senate uh, uh, controlled by the, the Democrats, but even the Republicans in the Senate can't control Tommy Tuberville, one of their members who's withholding, uh, you know, uh, military promotions. Mm -hmm. So the, the so what we're seeing, so we're seeing this spillover from inter-party conflict to intra-party conflict. Mm -hmm. And now the nation, now the founding fathers created these three institutions, Congress, President, and, and the uh, Supreme Court. So there'd be checks and balances one another. So there was, that was the intent to make sure, to, to slow down uh, sort of legislation, to slow down, uh, uh, you know, public policy. But it's, it's now such a common feature, say 73% since Reagan on the Congress has uh, been a divided government. Right. And it was rare to, uh, uh, now part of that is due to the fact that people, uh, straight ticket voting has declined. And so now you get split ticket voting. Mm -hmm. People voting for parties, different parties. In Vermont, you know, we have a frequent case of governors and lieutenant governors being a different party, like, like right now with, mm -hmm. with uh, Phil Scott and Dave Duckerman. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, so these are some of the changes that have taken place. Sure. And the Congress, and, uh, now back to the House, the, uh, uh, the, uh, excuse me, okay, I'll get my little cheat sheet here. Uh, <laughs> the Speaker of the House, by the way, is named before the, the President. In the Constitution, the uh, Senate says the House shall choose its Speaker, and this occurs in the seventh paragraph of Article One. The President isn't mentioned until the first paragraph of Article Two. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason for this is they understood legislatures more than they understood executive authority, because mm -hmm. executive authority was exercised by royal governors, who were the appointees of the Crown. Mm -hmm. Now the speakers where they were uh, elected by the members of the, of the legislatures, of the, you know, the colonial assemblies, as they were called. And they, so the speakers were elected by the coroners, the governors were, were named by the, by the crown. Mm -hmm. And so we've always had this tension between you know, executive and legislative authority. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's you know, staring us in the face once again. Sure. And uh, the last president to have a Democrat have both the House and Senate as Democrats was Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And he was a relatively weak president. And ironically, he had a better sort of uh, congressional circumstance uh, than, than any of the others. And every president since then has had at least one divided uh, government. Right. And uh, so. Right. So, so Biden, of course, is having to live with it as well. Right. So I think we just have a, maybe a minute or two left yeah. here, Professor uh, Garrison Nelson. Do you anything else that you haven't mentioned about the speakership that that um, that's on your mind about this crisis that we're in right now? Uh, not well. The uh, speakership, as I say, has been in existence for you know, uh, well, it started in England, obviously, and its first year was like 1377. Uh, sort of uh, 400 years before our nation was uh, it began its uh, break from England, mm -hmm. so it's a um, it's a remarkable office. And um, the, uh, uh, the the quote. Uh, oh, I'm, I'll tell you one final story. I was working on a book on speakers and presidents, which I had a heart attack and slowed me on it rather substantially. But Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. In, in uh, 1981, Ronald Reagan is sworn in, and shortly thereafter, at the end of March, he's shot by uh, John Hinckley in an effort to impress Jodie Foster. Mm. Bizarre story. Mm. In any case, he's in the hospital, uh, and uh, Strom Thurmond, who was the, then the senior Republican, decides to go visit him, and he 
sort of breaks it, they, 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 he busted uh, Reagan's, Reagan's hospital room. Nancy is infuriated. Is in fact, she says, she says, no one is allowed to get in the room, no one, except Tip. Wow. Except Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House. Wow. So Tip goes into the room, and he sees Reagan, and Reagan's in all, and very compromised. And what he does is he takes Reagan's hand. And he goes and he kneels on the floor and he holds Reagan's hand and he says the Lord's Prayer. Mm. And then gets up, kisses Reagan on the forehead, and leaves. Mm. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Can you imagine Mike Johnson or Kevin McCarthy doing that? Doing that to, to Joe <laughs> Biden. Biden. No, it's just <laughs> no. a wonderful story. Yeah. And, and, and apparently it was viewed by. A couple of people who re re relayed the story, yeah. and uh, but that's that's how it once was yeah. <laughs> in the good old days, mm. as opposed to what we have right now. Wow. Well, Professor Garrison Nelson, thank you so much for coming in to, oh. to talk with us about this today, and yeah. thank you for tuning into Town Meeting TV. You can find this program and many more at ch17.tv and on our YouTube channel for Town Meeting TV. So long.